It's Saturday the 2nd of April 1502 and at Ludlow Castle in Shropshire a Tudor tragedy is about to occur. 15-year-old Arthur, Prince of Wales, eldest son of Henry VII and Elizabeth of York, is at death's door. His 16-year-old wife, the Spanish princess, Catherine of Aragon, Princess of Wales, is gravely ill too. She's going to recover, but Arthur, the boy who was born to be king, is not. This is History Calling, where I bring you new videos every week on all aspects of the past, and today we have the story of the death, embalming, funeral and burial of Prince Arthur plus what archaeologists found when they examined his tomb in 2002. Prince Arthur was born on the 19th of September 1486, and his birth signalled the ultimate union of the houses of York and Lancaster. The Wars of the Roses had raged between these two branches of the Plantagenet dynasty for decades, until, in August 1485, Henry Tudor, a Lancastrian, had defeated the Yorkist king Richard III at the Battle of Bosworth, then married Richard's niece, Elizabeth, who was the daughter of the deceased Edward IV and the sister of the missing princes in the Tower. There were still threats to the throne, however, and so the pair's position was immeasurably strengthened by the quick birth of Arthur, their first male heir. Named after England's mythical king, his parents had high hopes for him, and he was well-educated and showered with titles, including being made Prince of Wales and a Knight of the Bath while still just a toddler. It was also crucial that he made a spectacular marriage, as this would help to solidify and legitimise Tudor power in England on the European stage. Negotiations began with Spain to have Arthur marry Catherine of Aragon as early as 1488, and after a few false starts and two proxy weddings in 1499 and 1500, the pair eventually married in person in St Paul's Cathedral on the 14th of November 1501. Whether this marriage was ever consummated, though, is hotly debated, and would become of crucial importance decades later, but it's not something I'm going to get into here. Instead, I already have a video on that topic, which I'll leave linked for you. In December, they set off for Ludlow Castle, where they established their home, and it was there, barely three months later, that the Prince and Princess of Wales both fell seriously ill. We are fortunate to have an almost contemporary account of the death and burial of Arthur, which is part of a larger document called the Receipt, meaning Reception, of the Lady Catherine, and which internal evidence shows was written up at least four months after the Prince's death, but before Elizabeth of York's demise in February 1503. It was then later copied out by several scribes to create a fair copy. The original author was evidently a member of Henry's household and present when the news of the death came to the king, but someone who was also then dispatched to Ludlow for the funeral. Historian Gordon Kipling suggests that the Garter King of Arms, John Rife, is the most likely candidate, but whoever he was, he was on the whole a strong source. That said, he does not give us a clear cause of death for the prince. Like the issue of the marriage's consummation, the exact source of the couple's ailments is still unclear. Arthur fell ill on the 27th of March, and we are told in the above-mentioned source, the receipt, that he suffered from, quote, the most pitiful disease and sickness that with so sore and great violence had battled and driven in the singular parts of him inward, so that cruel and fervent enemy of nature, the deadly corruption, did utterly vanquish and overcome the pure and friendful blood, without all manner of physical help and remedy. Another writer said that the cause was, quote, a malign vapour which proceeded from the air, hardly a surprising view in an era when many illnesses and even plagues would be blamed on bad smells. In my video on the corpse of Henry I, for instance, I discussed the story of one of the men who prepared the body for burial and who died soon afterwards, supposedly because of the stench. One later source even backdated the onset of Arthur's illness to the first week in February and said that it was all because he had slept with Catherine. But that memory only surfaced rather conveniently in 1529, when Catherine's second husband, Arthur's brother, Henry VIII, was trying to prove that his brother and his wife had had relations so that he could annul his marriage to Catherine and marry Anne Boleyn. Various diagnoses for Arthur's final illness have been put forth on the basis of this scrappy evidence, 
including pneumonia, tuberculosis, influenza, the sweating sickness and even testicular cancer. But the fact that Catherine was ill too suggests to me at least that the last option is probably not correct, though it is always possible I suppose that the pair became sick with separate illnesses at the same time. After the prince's death, his boils were quickly removed and he was embalmed, stuffed with spices and placed in a wooden chest, the body having been so well preserved that it was felt no lead coffin was needed. The chest was covered with a black cloth with a white cross and iron rings on it and placed in the prince's chamber, quote, under a table covered with rich cloths of gold, having a rich cross over him and certain candlesticks of silver over him with tapers of wax burning, and four other great candlesticks of latoon, I'm not sure what that word is meant to be, with four great tapers continually burning there. Meanwhile, the news of the prince's death had been sent to Greenwich, where his parents were staying, and when it arrived on Monday night, the king's servants had his confessor break the news to Henry. Going to the king's chamber early on the Tuesday morning, he dismissed the other servants, then quoted the biblical book of Job in Latin to Henry, saying, Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? Then he, quote, showed his grace that his dearest son was departed to God. And when his grace understood that sorrowful and heavy tidings, he sent for the queen, saying that he and his queen would take the painful sorrows together. And after that she was coming, and saw the king, her lord and husband, in that natural and painful sorrow, as I heard say, that with full, great, and constant comfortable words she besought his grace that he would first, after God, remember the wealth of his own noble person, the comfort of his realm and of her, and how that my lady his mother, that's Lady Margaret Beaufort, had never no more children but him only, and that God by his grace had ever preserved him and brought him where that he was. Over that, how God had lent them yet a fair, goodly, and towardly young prince, the future Henry the Eighth, and two fair princesses, Margaret and Mary. And over that, God is where he was, meaning Arthur was now in heaven, and we both young enough, meaning young enough to have more children. And that the prudence and wisdom of his grace sprung over all Christendom, so that it should please him to take this according thereunto. Then the king thanked her of her good comfort, and after that she was departed and come into her own chamber, natural and motherly remembrance of that great loss smote her so sorrowful to the heart that those that were about her were fain to send for the king to comfort her. And then his grace of true, gentle and faithful love in good haste came and relieved her. Before I get to the funeral arrangements, if you're enjoying this content and would like more history, including many other videos about the Tudors and death in medieval and early modern England, please give this video a thumbs up, click the subscribe button beneath it, and hit the notification bell so that YouTube lets you know when I upload. You can also follow me on Instagram and check out my Patreon page for more from History Calling. At Ludlow Castle, the body was watched constantly until St George's Day, which is the 23rd of April, when it was removed to the town's parish church, a building which still exists today and which is called St Lawrence's Church. This removal marked the start of a series of complex and lengthy funeral ceremonies. The body was first taken to the castle's main hall by the yeoman of Arthur's chamber, under a cloth of black and gold topped by a cross of white cloth of gold. Three bishops who were present cast holy water and incense over it, after which it was carried to the church. The Earl of Surrey, dressed all in black, acted as chief mourner, and none of Arthur's immediate family were present. There was a canopy borne over the corpse, and at its four corners banners were carried, one showing the Trinity, another the patible, which is an archaic word meaning a cross or a crucifix, another the Virgin Mary, and the fourth St George. In front of the coffin was a banner showing Arthur's own coat of arms. Though Catherine wasn't there, she was represented by some of her countrymen, for two Spaniards, quote, of the best belonging to the princess, walked in front of the body alongside a whole array of religious men of the town, including bishops, priests and friars. We are also told by our anonymous writer of the receipt that the corpse was surrounded by scores of poor men in black mourning habits. The journey was short, for the church, then and now, is just a few minutes' walk from the castle. You can actually see its tower in this footage I shot from the top of the castle, and when the procession arrived, Arthur's remains were placed in the choir where a hearse had been prepared, the word hearse at this time meaning a framework over the coffin that poles could be draped over. The funeral service could now begin. 
First, there was a dirge, more often called a dirge nowadays, with an officer of arms in a high voice and positioned at the door of the church, calling out for Prince Arthur's soul and all Christian souls. There was also a Pater Noster, which is the Lord's Prayer in Latin. Then the Bishop of Lincoln sang a placebo, also known as Vespers, this is an evening prayer, and three lessons were read by Lincoln and the bishops of Salisbury and Chester. Then everyone returned to the castle, leaving the body in the church and under watch. The next day they returned and several masses were sung by children, the church's choir and the bishops present, sometimes to the sound of organ music, sometimes not. Mourners, including Lord Surrey, made offerings of gold, which I assume went to the church. A sermon was given by Arthur's almoner and confessor, a Dr. Edenham, and alms were given by him to the town's poor. Then, once again, we are told in the primary source, the lords, as before, went to dinner to the castle, leaving the body in the care of the church. On the third day, there was another mass sung by the abbot of Shrewsbury, and the Lord Grey made an offering for it, as the Earl of Surrey was apparently absent. Based on this later plaque in the floor of St Lawrence's Church, Arthur's heart, which may in fact have been his bowels as we know those were removed, was buried here, but the rest of his body still had another journey to make before it could be laid to rest. This journey would take it to Worcester Cathedral, and it was quite an unpleasant trip. The body was carried on what our primary source calls a chair, but which I imagine as a kind of chariot, as it had to be pulled by six horses and was escorted by what the writer calls three chariot men in mourning habits. The horses were covered with black cloth, as was the chariot itself, which was topped with a cross of white cloth of gold. The weather seems to have been abysmal, though. Our writer tells us that it was foil, and that additional cloths, including a sear cloth, which would have been water-resistant, had to be placed over the coffin slash chest to protect it and its expensive velvet trappings from the elements. In an era before umbrellas, the mourners just had to suffer, using their black mourning hoods to protect themselves as best they could. Some rode, but most walked, as they slowly made their way through the towns and villages on the way to Worcester. Things then went from bad to worse. On St Mark's Day, which is the 25th of April, he says, From Ludlow to Butley was the foulest, cold, windy and rainy day and the worst way that I have seen. It was so bad that the horses couldn't manage it, and oxen had to be brought in and hitched to the chariot to drag Arthur's body towards the town's chapel, where it was placed in the choir for the night while the bedraggled group of attendants, some of them the most prominent and powerful men in the land, went to dry off and get their dinner. The next morning, the Earl of Surrey offered more money for a mass to be given, and there was a general dole of pence of two pence to every poor man and woman. It's clear that this wasn't the only church along the route in which the body temporarily rested, for we are told that every church that the corpse remained in were well furnished of scutcheons, that's escutcheons, of my lord's arms, both of metal and of colours. And every parish church or religious place or order that met the corpse by the way with procession and rang their bells had a noble of gold, four torches and six scutcheons of arms. In other words, just as a royal event today, like a wedding, is good for the local economy, Arthur's death benefited the economies of the towns and villages he passed through, as their churches were given gifts as a thank you for housing him or paying their respects, and the local poor were given alms or dole money, as it's called in the source. Finally, the corpse arrived at Worcester. Thankfully, the weather had improved, and after replacing any missing escutcheons on the horses, which had presumably been given to all the other churches along the way that I just mentioned, the torchbearers, who were part of the procession's escort, had fresh torches given to them too, and all the procession's participants made sure they were lined up in their correct order as they entered the city. They were met by local dignitaries and churchmen who escorted them to the cathedral. There the body was removed from its chariot and borne into the church, still beneath its canopy and with banners carried around it. It was placed on a hearse in the choir, and apparently this hearse was quite something, the goodliest and the best wrought and garnished that ever I saw is how our eyewitness describes it. The body was surrounded by banners showing the arms of Arthur himself, his parents, his wife, her parents and many of the places he was associated with, including Wales and Normandy, the kings of England still claim to be kings of France at this point, remember. 
There was another funeral dirge, nine lessons read out, and the corpse was again sprinkled with incense. The actual term the source uses is sensed, but I'm assuming it means incense, especially as I know that was a common practice at Catholic funerals at this time, and is still used in many church services today. Yet again, the body was left in the church overnight, under guard, and at 8am the next day, the mourners returned for another series of masses and offerings. Arthur's armour of knighthood was now delivered up to the nobles present, and a horse, covered in rich trappings of velvet, was led into the choir and given to the church by Lord Gerard, the Earl of Kildare's son. It was a sombre scene, and many of those present were in tears, not just because of the tragedy of losing one so young and on whom so many hopes for the future of the realm had rested, but because these were people who had known Arthur personally, who had worked for him and who had clearly had great affection for him. Indeed, our witness tells us that he had a hard heart that wept not. Lord Pius then offered a rich pall of cloth of gold and tissue to the corpse, followed by five other lords and earls present. All were laid beside or on top of the chest containing Arthur's body. There was a sermon and more dole money handed out to the local poor, while the richly embroidered banner showing Arthur's arms was offered to and accepted by the deacon of the church. The corpse was sensed again, while the religious men and women from the church and the local convent sang divers and many anthems, as an officer of arms called out in a loud voice that this was all done for Prince Arthur's soul and all Christian souls. Finally, roughly four weeks after Arthur's death, it was time for the interment. All the poles piled on and around the corpse were removed, and it was carried to the graveside at the south end of the high altar. It was with weeping and sore lamentation that it was put in the grave, and the Bishop of Lincoln was seen to be sobbing as he placed a cross on top of the chest and cast holy water and earth over it. Arthur's officer of arms was also crying as he took off his coat of arms and added it to the grave's contents, as was Sir William Ideal, Comptroller of the Prince's household, when he had to take his staff of office, snap it in two over his head, and throw it in after his young master. He was followed by Sir Richard Croft, steward of Arthur's household, who broke and threw his own staff of office into the grave, as did the gentlemen ushers with their rods of office. It was, we are told, a piteous sight. Our contemporary account of the funeral finishes by telling us that with Arthur finally buried, there was ordered a great dinner, and the following morning a proclamation was made saying that if anyone was owed any money by Arthur's servants, they should show their bills to the Prince's steward, comptroller and cofferer, and they would be paid. And thus, says our anonymous author, God have mercy on good Prince Arthur's soul. Amen. The Prince of Wales had lived only 15 years. He'd been married less than five months and had no children. In the ordinary course of things, his death shouldn't have made that big of a difference to English history. He did, after all, have a younger brother to take his place as the heir to the House of Tudor. That brother, however, was the future Henry VIII, and as it turned out, Arthur's death and his brief marriage would ultimately cause completely unforeseen and enormous ructions for England, the effects of which are still in evidence today. Before we get to those, however, I'd like to take a minute to look at the more immediate results of his death. You'll remember that his mother, Elizabeth of York, had tried to comfort his father when the news of their firstborn's death came, by telling Henry that they were still young enough to have more children. Those weren't idle words. Within weeks, the 36-year-old Elizabeth was pregnant once again in an effort to bolster the Tudor regime, which was now hanging by the thread of young Prince Henry's life. Thus, one tragedy led to another. On the 11th of February, 1503, her 37th birthday, Elizabeth was delivered of a daughter who was called Catherine, but both mother and baby died soon afterwards. The Queen was buried in this vault in Westminster Abbey, where her husband ultimately joined her in 1509. At that point, their 17-year-old son, Henry, took the throne and quickly married his one-time sister-in-law, Catherine of Aragon, Dowager Princess of Wales. At first, the marriage went well, but the couple were unable to produce any son who lived more than seven weeks, and by the late 1520s, Catherine was past childbearing age and Henry had fallen in love with the much younger Anne Boleyn. Though the pair had obtained a papal dispensation to marry due to their prior relationship as siblings-in-law, 
Henry now claimed that the papacy could not dispense with God's laws and that the Bible specifically forbade him from wedding his brother's wife, which it doesn't, by the way. It says a man shouldn't sleep with his brother's wife, but should marry and care for his brother's widow. Catherine swore blind that she and Arthur had never done the deed, as it were, which would have meant that the marriage wasn't really complete. But Henry was determined to have his own way. When the papacy wouldn't rule in his favour, he split from the church in Rome, established the church in England, of which he was conveniently the head, and had their union annulled anyway. This was the English Reformation. The country's monasteries were dissolved, and although Henry wasn't really a Protestant, he was a Catholic who didn't want to be told what to do by the Pope and who wanted the monastery's wealth for himself, his actions paved the way for the establishment of Protestantism as the main religion in England and led to centuries of persecution against Catholics. And where can the seeds of all this chaos be traced to? Why, to that day back in April 1502, when a 15-year-old who should have been king died at Ludlow Castle. I'd like to finish by telling you about Arthur's grave, for he was given an elaborate monument in Worcester Cathedral, which you can see here. An excellent description of it was published in 1853, part of which reads, The gorgeous Chantry Chapel was erected in 1504, and a chantry founded for the performance of masses for the repose of the prince's soul. It is situated on the south side of the choir, filling up the space of the last arch next to the altar. The chapel consists of a small room, the entrance to which is by a door from the choir. It is divided into compartments by rich buttresses, covered with richly canopied niches containing figures. The spaces between the buttresses are filled with panelling, which at the ends is solid, but in the other parts pierced into windows. The whole is surmounted by a rich pierced parapet and pinnacles. The interior is richly panelled and the roof groined. The east end, where the altar formerly stood, is a mass of elaborate tabernacle work, containing figures of saints in niches, and divided into four compartments by buttresses similar to those on the exterior, but the figures are much mutilated. This chantry chapel was largely spared by the Reformation, and even by the government of Arthur's nephew, the virulently Protestant Edward VI, who reigned from 1547 to 1553, though I suspect the damage noted on the figures mentioned at the end of that description might have occurred during that time period. In 2002, it was examined using ground-penetrating radar, and it was established that Arthur's remains lie not within the large stone sarcophagus, which you see above ground and which is merely a memorial, but in a vault below it and slightly to one side, so the vault is partly beneath the sarcophagus, just to be clear. Archaeologists established that the grave was full of soil and other rubble, but Arthur's actual remains weren't located. Personally, I see no reason why they wouldn't be there, however, but as he was buried in a wooden chest, I don't think any bones which remain will be contained anymore, as that chest will have long since rotted away. Henry VIII and Jane Seymour's wooden coffins were gone by the 19th century, for instance, leaving only their leaden coffins. The prince's grave was not actually opened, as the monarch's permission would be required for that, but that same year, his funeral, or rather a heavily truncated version of everything I have described to you in this video, was reenacted at Worcester Cathedral to mark the 500th anniversary of his death. As for his wife, who he might reasonably have expected to be buried with him when the time came, although Henry reduced her back to the title of Dowager Princess of Wales after abandoning her, she was buried in Peterborough Cathedral when she died in 1536. See my video on her death and burial for more information. I've also left a link to an old news article from 2002 in the description box below if you'd like to read a little bit more about the radar findings. Before I leave you, a big thank you to my patrons and to those of you who donate to the channel using the thanks button beneath videos for your very generous support which helps me to keep creating for you. If you'd like to join my Patreon community and get some history calling perks including bonus material and early access to ad-free versions of my videos, check out the link in the description box below. Let me know in the comments too what you think killed Arthur Tudor, and until next time, keep learning.